Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 411 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. I'm Mike McDonald. I'm Vincent Davis. And later in the show, we will be joined by Brandon Robinson, co-host of Brown and Scoop, which is a weekly entertainment and sports podcast through CBS Radio's Play.it Network. On today's show, we will be discussing Vaughn Miller and Mohamed Wilkinson cashing in, Deflategate coming to uns an unceremonious end, Phil Jackson's thoughts on the three-point line, and Pat Riley issues a mea culpa. But to kick off the show, I'm going to pass the ball over to Mike, who is never full of hot air, and you've got some Deflategate news for us. Absolutely, Keisha. While we have to question whether or not Deflategate is actually over, and if it is, who here is most at fault? Is it Tom Brady, the NFL, or the New England Patriots themselves? Also, guys, I want to ask you, what type of impact will this have on Tom Brady's Hall of Fame legacy? First of all, and, and since the football is so important, why do they allow the teams, the quarterbacks, to have possession of the balls? Considering gambling, for consider ethics, and taking in consideration the integrity of the sport. Footballs, game balls, should be in the possession of league officials, whether they're special officials that are set up or um, referees throughout the entire game and before the game. They should not have, they should not be in the presence or in the possession of players for any team. Well, I think the NFL shoulders most of the responsibility in the fact that the flake gate has gone on as long as it has. I think that it stopped being about deflated footballs and more about Roger Goodell. And I think that the suspension came because of, one, the, I think the pressure of the other owners, the 31 owners, I'm excluding the Patriots of the, um, from this, and Goodell's ego because Roger Goodell chose to say that Brady violated the integrity rules instead of equipment tampering because that would give him more leeway to decide what his punishment is because if it was equipment, equipment tampering, there's very specific fines that go along with that. But with violating the integrity rule, Goodell has, it's at his discretion because, I mean, it's excessive for games, for equipment tampering, and it was his ego. It was Goodell saying, hey, you are not to dis you know, you are to cooperate with me, and if you don't, then you will be punished. And I think that's in essence what happened. And in terms of Tom Brady's legacy, look, before the Flake Gate, people either loved him or hate him, hated him. And I think that still holds true to this day. And Hall of Fame, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Say what you will about him, his accomplishments speak for themselves. And he's been able to do it without having consistent elite talent. He didn't always have a Jerry Rice. He didn't always have, he had Randy Moss one season, or maybe two if I'm not mistaken. But he never had, um, you know, any of the other Hall of Fame wide receivers. So I just think that the NFL shoulders more of the responsibility. I agree 100% with you, Keisha, specifically Roger Goodell. You know, Roger Goodell is the one that's really the one that has dragged this thing on and on. Now, let's let, let's face it. Yes, Tom Brady did destroy his cell phone, and that's not a good look right there. At the same time, we're talking about deflated v footballs. And, and as you pointed out, Vincent, players never should have been allowed to hold the game balls. You're absolutely right. That should have been restricted. It should have been in league care instead of giving the game footballs to the quarterbacks who are able to manipulate the, the, the game balls in any way that they want. I think as we get closer to the start of the football season, people are going to start talking a little bit more about how this will influence the Patriots season because as we know, Tom Brady will be on the sidelines for the first four games of the year. So people aren't really looking at that just yet because it's only the middle of, the of July. We're not at training camp just yet. This will have an influence and a big impact on the Patriots season. We'll get to that when we get there. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, as the Hall of Fame legacy is, concer is concerned, as you said, Keisha, there's a lot of Brady haters, a lot of Patriot haters, and this is the first thing that they're going to jump at. 
when we talk about Brady's career 20, 30 years down the line, he's a cheater, he's a cheater. The bottom line is the guy's a winner. And I understand he's not looking good in this situation here, but at the same time, as we've pointed out and we answered this question, the NFL is the one who looks the most responsible in this case. Yes, the Patriots screwed up, Tom Brady screwed up, but the way that the NFL has dragged this on and on and on for over a year now, about a year and a half, uh, it's not. A, it, it's just kind of just people are sick of, of talking about it. Yeah. So I guess now we can finally put it to rest. We think because the NFLPA has reserved the right to take this even further in court. So we'll see. We're going to go to Hotspot Miami, home of Miami Heat and team president Pat Riley. And Pat Riley just recently opened up his feelings about losing to Wade Wade in free agency. What do you think of his, his feelings, what he has said thus, thus far, and what do you think his legacy as team president is going forward? I think Pat Riley has two legacies in Miami. One is what he's done as a head coach with the Miami Heat. The other one is in the front office with the Miami Heat. And let's face it, he's been very successful in both positions. The guy has three championships under his belt in Miami, there in South Beach. I think that Heat fans and, and people in South Florida they have faith that Pat Riley has made the right decision. I'm sure that there are a lot of people that would like to see D-Wade finish his career. I mean, let's face it, they call it uh, Wade County down there because of what he's done over the course of, of really over the last decade and how he's built the name for himself. But I think that both parties have won here. Pat Riley, he for the short term, this is going to hurt Miami. They're going to be season tickets, you know, see, tickets are, sales are going to decline next year. They're not going to be winning as many games. But long term, this is going to be able to help the Miami Heat as they move forward. They're going to have more money in their pocket. I think Dwayne Wade going to Chicago, going home. They're not a championship contender, and I guarantee that as we get into the season, we're going to hear people chirping about maybe Wade should try to talk to Cle uh, Cleveland front off uh, Chicago's front office about moving to, to play with LeBron James. But I think both sides have won out here. I know that it doesn't look, look good necessarily for Pat Riley by letting Wade walk out the door, but in the long term, this will help the Heat as they have more money to spend on free agents in, in the future. Once they put the team together for the season and we see how it works, the new players, they start winning, it'll be love all over again. I think that, you know, I love Pat Riley, but I think that this latest Mia Copa is more of a PR move. And because if anybody could have signed Dwayne Wade, it was Pat Riley. There was nothing stopping him from getting on the plane to New York to meet with Dwayne Wade when he met with Mickey Arison, who is the Heat owner. And if Pat Riley wanted to, he could have pulled a banana boat right next to Dwayne Wade and started talking contracts. The fact is that he didn't want to sign him. And this was his way to get Dwayne Wade out of the door. And this, this recent opening up of his feelings is trying to soften the blow to make him look like he's not a shrewd businessman who just kicked Dwayne Wade, the Miami's child, you know, the, the face of Miami out the door because he was no longer useful, but rather than, you know, somebody who really didn't want to let him go, but it was just best for the team moving forward that he did. And as far as his legacy, Pat Riley is known as being very shrewd, a shrewd negotiator, and he showed that too. And he's also shown to be, uh, to let people know that he's in charge, no matter what your superstar status is, his, it's, his way or the highway. And it was that kind of thinking that reportedly let LeBron left, um, made LeBron leave Miami to go back to Cleveland. So um, we'll see. Like Mike said, Miami's really not going to do much this year. And the arrows are going to try to, are going to be um, slung in Pat Riley's direction. But he's trying to soften that right now. Based on what you just said, do you think that if Pat Riley didn't want Dwayne Wade to resign Dwayne Wade. Did the owner want to resign Dwayne Wade? Or was, or was this just a, a um, uh, something that they did just to show good faith? I think that the way that the Miami Heat have worked things out over the last, what now, almost 20 years that Pat Riley has been in Miami, I think that Mickey Arison, and the reason why he's such a great owner, is that he does give Pat Riley 100% control of the franchise. In other words, basketball operations, Pat Riley's in charge. And I think that Mickey Arison is not one of these owners 
uh, who's going to say, no, I want you're going to have to sign Dwayne Wade. If it, if it was like that, Pat Riley never would have went to Miami 20 years ago. I think the reason why he loves this job in South Beach and the why he's been able to make such a name for himself as a coach and in the front office is because Mickey Harrison does give him full, complete control of how to run the team on a daily basis. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. The Denver Broncos and Von Miller ended their contract stalemate with Miller signing a six-year, $114.5 million contract with $70 million in guaranteed money. Did you think that this outcome would have been resolved in any other solution, in any other way? And what do you think about those who have the opinion that quarterbacks are the only people who should have these kind of contracts? I think personally that each player should get what they can negotiate. The only um, ceiling I see is on rookies. I, I'm a staunch believer whether a quarterback, whether a linebacker, whatever position that they play, that they should have a limit, that, that they should not get an exorbitant amount of money as if they've already played a game um, professionally. Um, other than that, if you have the leverage to, to, to extract millions of dollars from that team and they have no other choice, then they should pay you. And as you point out, Vincent, you know, uh, Von Miller, after last year's playoff run, Super Bowl run, uh, Von Miller had a lot of leverage. And I think that, as you asked, Keisha, should, should other players, aside from the quarterback, be paid the amount of money that, that Von Miller's being paid? Absolutely. Von Miller was sensational. One of the greatest Super Bowl for performances that we've seen from any player, the way that he set, set the tone in the Super Bowl for the Broncos and for their defense. We thought that this was going to be a close game between Carolina and Denver going in. And Denver crushed him. And the big reason for that was because of Von Miller. He deserves the money that he's getting. I'm hoping that there's no bitterness for him. I, I'm actually pulling for Denver. I feel bad for Denver in a way because of the way that things have worked out. This is a team, they're really, you know, they should be a Super Bowl contender with that defense that they have. And the quarterback position for them is something that's very shaky as they go into training camp in just a couple weeks. So to answer the question, Keisha, I think that, and, and as you said, uh, Vincent, that Leverage is a huge thing. Von Miller had a lot of it, and he deserves every nickel, if not more, that he's getting from the Denver Broncos. Yeah, there's no way, no way that the Broncos could have let Von Miller walk, especially they've already lost some key players over, you know, during the offseason, but there's no way that they could have let him go, given what he did last season. He almost single-handedly brought a championship back to Denver. And I, you know, I am... One of my favorite sayings is, offense wins games, defense wins championships. And the Denver Broncos fit that to a T. And as far as the money, you know, I think that there's, there's enough money to, to go around. And I think you should be, you should be paid what, you, what you're worth. And if your defense, I mean, and it's not even just the Super Bowl. It carried them throughout the whole season because right. you had a hobbly, wobbly arm Peyton Manning, and if he wasn't on the field, then you had someone who was essentially a rookie and Brock Osweiler. Nice. And if you look at the, the scores of the game, they were putting up these big 30, 40-point games like they did the season before. So that defense really came through, and everybody who wants to return and who's up for contract rene renegotiation should be paid handsomely. Well, we should send we should send them a picture with uh, Elway's picture back in the in the picture from um, it was X'd out, or circled out, or right, right. Oh, yeah, tweet. Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, we go to golf now. Over the weekend, what a classic British Open we had, and an astonishing finish. Uh, professional golfer Henrik Stenson was able to capture the 2016 British Open trophy. Guys, I got to ask you, Phil Mickelson was great, but what happened over the weekend where he wasn't able to finish on top? I'm not an expert on golf. My, my, my knowledge is a little on the par, but you can, t you can see that Phil Nicholson played a great game, a really good game. Stinson played even better. He was only three strokes behind. Um, the, the, by, by, not, by not winning, he does become the, the second uh, leading uh, winner of runner-ups, um, held by Jack uh, Nicholson, who leads at 19. He lost. He lost. Now he has eleven, and he he could have won his sixth major, but he didn't. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not a golf aficionado. I'm still looking for Tiger Woods. I mean, because <laughs> he was the one who got me to watch t golf even just a little bit. And unfortunately, just breaking news, um, it's announced that he will not be playing in 2016 right. as he recovers from his back surgery. Yeah, Vincent, as you point out, 11 second place finishes for Phil Mickelson. And he, a lot of those second place finishes have been so, so close. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking losses. And what a weekend for both players. It's, it's rare that two players who are so close to the top are so superior to all the other golfers. I think, Keisha, you have the same response that a lot of sport fans have, including myself. Yeah, great weekend for the British Open, but what's the story with Tiger Woods? And I think that's what we're all asking is, where's Tiger? What's going on? Kind of sad not to know that he's not going to be appearing in any majors. I know we're all pulling for him. We're all rooting for him. But really, we're just, you know, we're, we're just anticipating when this guy is going to come back and get back on the golf courses. Yeah. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. As I teased earlier, we are now joined by Brandon Robinson, co-host of Brown and Scoop. What's right? going on? Yeah, you got it. Right on the money. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Doing well. Welcome Trying to the show. To Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Pleasure is ours. Yes, man. Mike. New yep. York Jets. New York Jets. Big story from last week. The New York Jets finally removed the franchise tag, and Muhammad Wilkerson, the elite 3-4 defensive end, is going to be back with the team. My question is, what took so long to get Mo Wilkerson back in for Gang Green? And also, do you guys think that this will have an impact on the stalemate between the Jets and Ryan Fitzpatrick? It's about time they paid him. He, he, he's, he was worthy of the money that he received. He's worthy of being paid. Um, as, as as a top player, he's going to get 17 million per season, and um, you know the players love him. He's great in the locker room. He's great out on the field, and he deserves the money. And it, it really took too long. I mean, especially after the guy broke his leg. When when he broke his leg last year, um, the last game of the season, you really understand why some players, like say for example, Darrell Rivas, does what he does. He tries to extract the greatest amount of money and and hold the team up if he has to to get paid. He's a Rex Ryan guy, a guy that I was left over, that stayed after Rex Ryan uh, departed for Buffalo Bills. But I first became familiar with Wilkerson and my fantasy football team. I was I was short of a defensive guy, and I put him in, and I think he got me like 13 points. So the fact that I, aside from that, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention he plays for the Jets. That green showed me the money. I think he's a guy that you want to kind of franchise in, in, a, in a world where guys on the defensive end are, are starting to really get paid, and not just get paid, but get guaranteed money. It's not solely uh, in, incentive-laden in, in, in the contractual structure, but I think for, for Muhammad Wilkinson to come in, a guy that's local uh, in New Jersey, guy to stay home, play for the hometown team, and, and make some money and, and, and lead Gang Green and AFC to something spectacular potentially, um, I, I think it's great and it's a step in the right direction where a lot of players in both the NBA and NFL are getting paid. Who knows why it took him this long? Look, they they still don't have a contract with Ryan Fitzpatrick, so I don't know what took them so long to sign Wilkerson, but glad that they did. And I don't think this is going to have a really meaningful impact on what's happening between the Jets and Fitzpatrick. The signing of Wilkerson gives them a little more cap room because they did remove the franchise tag on him, but they're still far away from the number that Fitzpatrick wants. And it's going to take some maneuvering to even get closer. And it's maneuvering that they could have done already. So to me, unless we've got training camp coming up next week, and unless for some reason the Jets really feel the pinch of not having Fitzpatrick, Fitzpatrick's going to sit out unless he decides that he doesn't want to and is going to take whatever money the Jets will give him. We're going to leave MetLife Stadium in Jersey. We're going to go through the tunnel or maybe the Verrazano Bridge, whichever one you choose. And we're going to land in Brooklyn, and we're going to talk about the Nets. Jeremy Lin, Anthony Bennett, and others were introduced as Nets to the media. With the signing of Jeremy Lin, do you guys think that the Nets will get more of the back page of the dailies? And with Anthony Bennett, do you think that this might be his chance to really shine under the tutelage of Coach Kenny Atkinson? Well, you know, go ahead, Mike. 
it's tough for the Nets to get exposure here in New York for whatever reason. They made the playoffs two seasons ago, and it was a tough season that year for the Knicks. And even still, when the Nets were making the playoffs, it, for whatever reason, even still coming to Brooklyn, it's hard for them to get exposure in the media, on the sports talk radio. Now, again, if they start winning, things can turn around. I like the moves that they've made. Anthony Bennett, you've got nothing to lose bringing the guy in. And Jeremy Lin, I think, is a great fix. Having him return to the Big Apple, the guy's familiar with the New York area. He's He's won here. He's been successful. Really started, orchestrated his career here. And he has familiarity with uh, their first-year head coach, Kenny Atkinson. So after a tough season for Brooklyn, I like what they've done with the basketball decisions that they've made, specifically Sean Marks, the first-time general manager. I think that they're really doing a good job trying to turn this franchise around. Yeah, I think uh, Sean Marks coming out of the San Antonio uh, Spurs system of, of greatness, if you will. Um, I, I, people that I've spoken to within the Nets organization have just indicated even uh, taking a step and just kind of distance them, themselves as far as the draft. At the draft this year, while most teams were at the Barclays Center, they were act actually at their headquarters doing their own private drafting and, and kind of strategizing and kind of getting their Yoda from Star Wars on, if you will. But I, I think that uh, for Kenny Ak Atkinson, I think in year one, uh, having a relationship with Jeremy Lin is vital. Uh, I think Anthony Bennett after the last couple of years uh, being traded in the Kevin Love deal that sent him to uh, to Minnesota for, uh, yeah, so Kevin Love, I think that um, even in Minnesota, I think slowly but surely he was starting to kind of get acclimated. I think it was a lot of pressure coming out of the, the NBA draft a few years ago. Um, and I also think that he has a fresh start where people are paying more attention to the Knicks. Uh, right now on paper, the Knicks do look better. I still do think that they're about a 31-41 to 41, uh, win uh, ball club uh, this coming season. But the Nets have low expectations. Perhaps they can get higher results. So we'll see what happens with that. The Knicks have been regressing for the last few years. Um, signing of Jeremy Lin was an excellent business move, excellent marketing. If Jeremy Lin wants to get back on the back pages, it's up to Jeremy Lin. Same thing he did when he was here in his second year. He's got to score. He's got to make it happen. Right now, Jeremy Lin, Brooke Lopez are the nucleus of this new Nets team, and they just have to go from there. And same with the, uh, with, with the management, with the acquisitions, with trades, with how are they going to do it. It's up to the Nets to, to, to bring attention to themselves. I, I think a screen and roll uh, center that, that, that Brooke Lopez is, I think it'll be Christmas early uh, for he and Jeremy Lin uh, spreading the floor. I think, uh, you know, Rondé Hollis Jefferson potentially having a, a healthy season. Uh, he's been playing well in the Summer League uh, over the last little while. Um, and I also think I, I'm going to miss Jared Jack playing for the Nets this season. Mm -hmm. I think he came out uh, with an ACL injury this season, signed with the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, but I, I think that the Nets are going in that young direction, and I think there may be like one or two pieces away um, from being competitive. I think maybe being on the, the, the Knicks' level, I think the Knicks are a competitive team. I think, that, but there are some questions there where there's some guys that have something to prove. I think Sean Marks has something to prove, Atkinson has something to prove, and uh, Jeremy Lin is going to sell some tickets. Everyone in New York has something to prove. Yes. Now we'll to go over the Brooklyn Bridge. We're not going to talk about the Knicks exactly, but we're going to talk about team president Phil Jackson. And many people, I'm eager to see what your guys' reaction is to this. Is Phil Jackson out of his mind for wanting a four-point line? Now, and also, by the way, he's recommending eliminating the 24-second shot clock in favor of a 30-second shot clock. Is Jackson being serious here? And what do you think? Maybe he's just messing with people's heads, or is this something that he's really on to? I think this is the point in uh, bas basketball is a year-round global sport. I think this is the point where we're kind of stretching for quotes when it's media access time. And um, could we move to the next topic? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think in all seriousness, I mean, Phil is stoic. Uh, I think that Phil, uh, he knows what to say to get people talking. Um, could you imagine a, a nine twenty four second shot clock? Like, that's like erasing all my memories of playing NBA Jam. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, a, a thirty second clock is going to cut down on possessions of each team, and it's going to slow the game down more. He states that it gives the uh, low post players an opportunity to to get the ball. If they can't get the ball in twenty four seconds. Wait till the next possession. Keep it moving. In terms of a four four point shot, I have nothing against a four a four point shot. Um, you're just gonna have more people jacking it up more. Um, so <coughs> Steph Curry, <laughs> 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 who said that? Uh, I don't know. It sounded like it came from that side of the table. I mean, <laughs> who knows Phil Jackson's motivation? He it sounds 
on on its surface like the ramblings of some stodgy old grandpa just wanting to talk but um, could he be ahead of his time? I don't know. He's a Zen master. Maybe he's on another plane and we're just not there yet. But I don't know what advantage it, uh, having a four-point line is going to have. I'm already tired of people just jacking up threes. every. You know, as soon as they touch the ball, they're jacking up threes. And I don't think a four-point line is going to make that any, you know, it's not going to make it more palatable for me to watch the game. And as far as adding more seconds to the clock, I'm kind of with Vincent on this. That's the coach's responsibility to get his team to run an offense within the time that you're given. You've got 24 seconds to, to get the ball to whomever it needs to touch it. And if you can't do that, then somebody's not doing their job and they need to go. Mike D'Antoni might have something to say about that. I think his offense in Phoenix was like 10 seconds of right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Still a guy such as yourself, I can see why you're kind of like, uh, Phil was a big man too. So I think that uh, when, he, when he played in, in, in the NBA, right. so I think he's going to always kind of uh, be on the side of the big man. So, well, it, it, it's like we can't win with these rules. Let's create some new ones. Maybe we can adapt right. to them. Give us a, a fresh start. Well, the one thing the NBA, one thing that the, I'm not pro four point line, but one thing that it would do is it would allow teams that are down by 20 points, 25 points in the third quarter. It would give them an opportunity to kind of get back into the game. I'm not for the point four point line at this point in time. Uh, but the thing is, is that it does point out to a lot in the NBA in the regular season and then into the playoffs and even in the NBA finals, especially the first two games, we had a a lot of blowouts. There were a lot of blowout games, and I think that that's something that, that we really need to be aware of because people are tuning out, especially in November and December where you're tuning in to a Sunday night game or a weeknight game where before it's the playoffs and a team is down by 15 after the first quarter. Uh, it's just something to be aware of, but I think we're all in agreement for right now, no four-point line. Uh, and also, hitting your free throws would help. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. As you know, every week, someone's either going in the bench or they're going into the doghouse. So who is it, Keisha? Who is it this week that's going in on the bench? This week, the lucky winner is Brock Lesnar. He is going on the bench. Brock Lesnar is facing a USADA anti-doping violation after he tested positive for a banned stuff substance um, from a sample that was taken from him on June 28th. Yeah, and then right after this, John Jones, apparently there was some anti-doping, uh, there were uh, some doping violations involved with him too. Not a good look for the UFC, I think, though. MMA, it's so popular right now that even with these allegations and everything that's gone on, it'll still be a sport that's so fast-growing. But as you pointed out, Keisha, really not a good look for Brock Lesnar here to go out and fight in UFC 200, get everybody talking about him, and then this negative, negative media speculation occurs. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy-saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. I hope you have your pen, paper, smartphone, or whatever you need ready because here are the events that are in the pipeline. The New York Yankees are playing the final game of a three-game homestand against the San Francisco Giants tomorrow, July 24th, while the Mets will be in Florida and they play the Marlins wrapping up their three-game series. The Jets and Giants are looking up their training camps this week. The Jets on the 27th and the Giants on the 28th. And the USPGA will take place in nearby Springfield, New Jersey on July 28th to July 31st. And the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro will begin on August 5th and will continue to August 21st. So, unfortunately, this is the time where we have to say goodbye to all of you, our friends out there. But don't worry, you can keep up with us until we meet again next week by liking us on Facebook, following us on Instagram and Twitter, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 411 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, Vincent Davis, and our special guest, Brandon Robinson, we thank you for joining us this week, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.